welcome you to the 496th, we're heading into the 500, in our series of Distinguished Speaker Programs. I'm Marjorie Turnbull, your club president. Um, I would also like to recognize Frost Burke, who is a former member of the board of Springhouse. I, I think most of you probably know that there is a Frank Lloyd Wright design residence here in Tallahassee that was done for the Lewis family. Uh, Frost is no longer on the board, but he calls himself still a uh, foot soldier for Springhouse. Uh, they are open every Sunday, every second Sunday, I guess it is of the month, is that right? And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's 150th birthday would be on June 8th, but they will be celebrating the following Sunday June 11th, so put that on your calendars and go join and celebrate with the group at Springtown. You'll hear Stuart's journey on how he got from where he was. Uh, you've read the short bio on the table where he has an undergraduate degree in engineering. He got his law degree from Loyola in Chicago and his, M his MBA from Emory University. He spent a uh, couple of decades in corporate life as an intellectual property attorney and fought the battles, fought the good war, but then all of a sudden woke up one day and realized his passion was somewhere else. He'll take you through that journey. By nature, he would view himself as an explorer, having traveled through over 66 countries. He loves history, and he loves food. And he is just a great guy. But he made me a believer in every one of us who were out there a year ago, which is why he's been kind enough to join us here today. So please join me in welcoming Stuart Graff. here and then as tall. The, uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Economic Club of Florida. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my 66 countries, but this is my first visit to Tallahassee. Took a little walk around, and uh, Steve gave me a little education this morning, and just a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I currently occupy uh, a residence in Phoenix. The Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation is based at one of his homes, Talius and West in Scottsdale, Arizona. So I hang out a lot with tarantulas, coyotes, bobcats. Um, I'm happy that we share something. We share rattlers and rattlesnakes, so go rattlers. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, what I've been trying to figure out is between Seminoles, e eagles, and rattlers, how it is that some gators got into the room? <laughs> that's what I understand the landscape around here to be. So uh, the, uh, I'll be watching on November 25th to see how, how the, uh, the gators and the Seminoles sort that out between them. The, um, I'm just curious, how many of you are familiar with the work of Frank Lloyd Wright? That's great. He is the only architect that most people in America, and indeed most people in the world can name spontaneously. How many of you have visited a Frank Lloyd Wright building? Okay, well, most of you, so that's, that's terrific. Uh, my guess is that uh, if asked about Frank Lloyd Wright, you probably know something about the Prairie School. You've heard that. You might know something about mistresses, <laughs> murders, and you certainly have probably heard about leaky roofs, right? We're in the midst of working on a, uh, on, on trying to secure a Presidential Medal of Freedom for Frank Lloyd Wright, this being his 150th uh, anniversary. Um, he has never gotten the recognition from our nation's government, um, which seems surprising because many others have, including many foreign-born architects, but a man who championed American architecture somehow has not been recognized. So we thought that President Trump, with his concerns about leaks that he can't fix, might have some sympathy for Frank Lloyd Wright. <laughs> Given that this is the Economic Club of Florida, I'm talking with Marjorie and Steve about the presentation, because there's a lot of ground we could cover with Frank Lloyd Wright, a 92-year lifespan, a 70-plus-year career. What we decided to do is to try to focus ourselves on, on Frank Lloyd Wright and the business community. And uh, as you'll hear in a moment, I'm a brand guy. I've spent my whole professional life focused on brands. My mother likes to say that of the first words that I that I, I uttered were trademarks because I'd go around reading the sign on every gas station and every shop in the neighborhood. So it seems like a lifelong obsession with brands. And Frank Lloyd Wright, I did a couple of important things that are irrelevant to a business conversation. First, he was a very, very powerfully branded individual. So we'll talk about that. Um, the young people in the room 
will know that, that all of their career counselors are talking about creating your own brand. Are you guys hearing that? Create your own brand? So Frank Lloyd Wright was doing that 70, 80 um, years ago, um, and then we'll talk about that. But we'll also talk about how he understood brands, how he had a very uh, really uh, uh, prescient view of branding, was well ahead of his time, and how he helped business people build their brands through his architecture. So hopefully this won't bore you. We've got about 20, 30 minutes. I want to thank the tech staff. We were having some IT problems. And no one just wants to hear somebody prattle on about Frank Lloyd Wright without showing some pictures. So we've got a screen up at the end of the room. And uh, I won't mind if you're not looking at me. Um, the, uh, but there's better things to see. Let's see if we can make this go. OK, so um, Steve mentioned a little bit about my background here. Um, and, uh, and it asked me to talk about this. So I, uh, as mentioned, I had, well actually, let me back up before, before what's on this slide. I first discovered Frank White Wright as an eight-year-old boy. I was educated in an unusual program in the Chicago Public Schools, programs that I wish we could afford with our school systems today. Um, I wasn't a conventional learner in the classroom. I was that kid who was always making trouble because he was bored in the regular classroom. And so they had a place for us, which was not detention. It was a, a program where we would spend our time going out to museums, going to national laboratories, going to hospitals, um, going to all kinds of places, um, and being inspired by those places to undertake projects um, from which we would learn. And then we'd go off and do our research, and a lot of it was self-guided learning. But much of that learning began in museums. I have a very strong belief that museums exist to change minds. If they're not doing that, then they shouldn't, they shouldn't be around. Um, they're a very expensive pastime if all they are is a way to kill a couple of hours. Um, and so I say that from personal experience. One of the first places that we visited in that program was a building uh, designed by a couple of Chicago architects who hired a young draftsman named Frank Lloyd Wright to design the lobby. Um, by the time I saw it, as an eight-year-old boy in 1971, the lobby was a wreck. It had, uh, the building had fallen into disrepair. The glass um, uh, canopy over the core of the building was now covered with black uh, paint and lead to protect it from the rain, so there wasn't light coming in. Paint was peeling everywhere. It was a disaster. But there was a photograph of what the lobby originally looked like, and that photograph coupled with what I could see in the building and my imagination, inspired me to just start looking at buildings and looking at the world differently. I saw light, I saw balance, and I became obsessed with Frank Lloyd Wright. My project going home that day um, uh, was to build a model of the building, and my teacher was one of the first of many, many people who said, you have no drawing talent, and you should not consider a career in architecture. <laughs> they were right. Um, so it took, it took a while to figure out how I could make a living at this Frank Lloyd Wright thing, and, and I've been doing that for the last 18 months. Um, I've been working on nonprofit boards for 30 years. Um, if you're in the business world, I encourage you strongly to take up some nonprofit interests. Um, it really takes care of your soul in the way that your business might take care of your wallet. Um, and, uh, and I was chatting about this with a friend who said, you know, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, one of my clients, she's our IP lawyer, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation is looking for a CEO. And on Lynn's first day of work, Lynn being a friend, on Lynn's first day of work at Chip Harden Law Firm, um, she was my mentee, and I took her out to lunch, and then I gave her a walking tour of Chicago architecture, because I'd been a docent for the Architecture Foundation. And she said, I know you love architecture. One of my clients, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, is looking for a CEO, and you'd be fabulous at it. Put a resume together, got the board to lower its standards, and here I am. <laughs> um, it made sense because we have a strong brand licensing program. We have to differentiate ourselves as a brand because there are 70 plus Frank Lloyd Wright organizations around the country. So how do we make ours stand out and be special? Um, we needed somebody who had an understanding of brand strategy. We are also um, are financially very dependent on generosity. We didn't have a good financial strategy for stable financing of all the projects that we undertake. And having led a few turnarounds in business, they thought I could do the job. So that's, that's how I get to where I am. Um, as Steve and I have talked about this journey, uh, first in Scottsdale a year ago and then this morning, you know, the thing that comes through very clear is, is that you get the greatest satisfaction in life. Uh, and I loved all the careers that I've had, 
but this is the best job I've ever had because I make a living taking something I've been passionate about now for 46 years, and my job is to inspire that passion in other people. So hopefully I'll have a chance to inspire some of that passion in you today. It's a great way to make a living, I recommend it. But enough about me. Let's talk about Frank Lloyd Wright, whose 150th birthday we are celebrating. He's born in 1867. We'll see if all these animations work. Um, uh, he's born in 1867, two years after the Civil War. So think about that. This is a man whose architecture we still find relevant and even modern today. He was born just after the Civil War <coughs> to a family in Wisconsin um, that had come here from Wales. They're known in the area as the God Almighty Lloyd Joneses. The area of Wisconsin, that there are a bunch of Unitarian ministers in the family. Um, the, the area of Wisconsin is known as uh, the, uh, the, I don't know if you can see that picture very well, but it's unglaciated, so it's not the flat Midwest that you know. It's actually got a tremendous amount of terrain in western Wisconsin. Um, and that landscape comes to inspire rights. Um, and he's educated by his, his aunts, who form one of the first kindergartens in America, um, in uh, something known as the Froebel blocks, these simple geometric shapes that would become the source of inspiration for Frank Lloyd Wright's entire career. Just simple geometry, squares and spheres and cubes, um, rectangles and triangles and parallelograms underlie every bit of his work. Everything is designed on a simple geometric plan. His love of nature, as I mentioned, is inspired by the landscape, and that's a view of the Wisconsin River right outside of uh, Taliesin, his home in Wisconsin. Um, that quote up there is from him. Nature is, beyond geometry, nature is the other source of inspiration for all of his work. And as he said, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. Those are lessons that we could be paying attention to today as we look at a more fragile world around us. Um, and how we build and, and, and design in that fragile world. He has less than one, he actually doesn't finish high school, and he matriculates at the University of Wisconsin. He has less than one year of engineering school before he leaves. He's eventually given a Doctor of Fine Arts from the university. They uh, are just erecting this year a, a, a plaque as an honored alumni, and I said it should be an honored honorary alumni because he had not much use for, uh, for college and formal education. He believed you learn more working with your hands and doing things rather than sitting in a classroom. Um, and so he leaves he, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. He goes down to Chicago. He uh, takes up with someone that his uncle had introduced him to a couple of years earlier, an architect named Joseph Silsby. Uh, Wright's first built work is a small chapel on the property at Taliesin in the Lloyd Jones Valley. Um, that Silsby designed. Silsby usually designs these big piles, houses and office buildings, but he designs this simple chapel uh, because as a member of the Unitarian Church, a friend of the Lloyd Jones family, he feels the need to do this as a favor and he takes young Frank in to do the draftsmanship. Frank goes to work for him in, in Chicago and less than a year later, the world begins to change. Um, in Chicago, he takes up with Louis Sullivan, the great uh, pioneer of modern architecture. That's his picture up on the screen. Uh, Sullivan is famous for the line, form follows function. You design a structure of a building and then you add adornment to it. Um, he and the other architects of Chicago designed the buildings of the World's Columbian Exhibition, and that's sort of the background in the slide there. Um, and it's at the World's Columbian Exhibition that Wright encounters Asian art. So here's a little factoid for you. Um, Wright makes more money over the course of his life buying and selling Asian art than he does as an architect. He's the largest trader of Asian art, at least in the United States, possibly in the Western world during his lifespan. And Asian art inspires everything that he does. It teaches him how to construct images, landscapes, views. Um, uh, he, along with Wright, with uh, Sullivan, <coughs> teaching him about modern architecture and modern materials, because this is a time when steel frames are used uh, to build skyscrapers, uh, when terracotta is being used as the adornment of buildings because you don't need masonry, you don't need brick and stone to construct a building anymore. Uh, Sullivan uh, teaches him all these things, um, and Wright starts to go off on his own and do his own work. Well, Sullivan wasn't pleased with that, so Sullivan fires him. 
Um, and the other architects of Chicago, including perhaps the, the, the most famous and important architect in Chicago, if not America at the time, Daniel Burnham, says, Mr. Wright, you're a talented young man, and we want to encourage your talent. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to pay for you to go study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris for a couple of years, because that's what great architects do. And then we're going to pay for you to go spend a couple of years in Italy at the American Academy in Rome. So you learn from classic Roman architects. You learn Palladio and all of the other greats of the classic world. And then when you come back, we will make you a partner in America's leading architecture firm. To which Frank Lloyd Wright said, no, thank you. <laughs> Wright wanted to create an American architecture, and he wanted to create his own voice. And he had no use for replicating the architecture of the classical world for bringing Europe further into the United States. He felt that our young democracy needed its own architecture to represent its own values. Wright also felt like that, that architecture from Europe didn't do very much for understanding the American landscape. It had no place in it. Remember, he's born in 1867. He's rooted in what is uh, called transcendentalism. This is the literature of Walt Whitman, uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau about living in this American landscape at one with the natural world, that that's the opportunity for us in this virgin territory that we should do better than Europe did. And so this becomes the source of his American architecture. I'll just say as a personal point that we get very impressed with Wright's buildings, but Wright's values around America are something that are very powerful to me. I feel we don't do enough in this country to celebrate his fundamental Americanness. He was one of the first people to really put American culture on a world stage, and that's something that sometimes gets forgotten. 1893, therefore, he opens his own studio in Oak Park. This is the studio, Marjorie, that you and, uh, and your, your colleagues visited um, uh, in Oak Park, Illinois. He hires Marion Mahoney, one of the first women to be licensed as an architect in America. She is his first employee. That's her picture on the right. Um, in fact, a third of the women in Wright's studio, over the a third of the people in Wright's studio over the course of his career were women. He hired people of every race, ethnicity. Uh, he didn't care about gender at a time when the word sexual orientation wasn't even coined. He didn't care about that. He cared about what you can do because one of the American values that he felt very strong about was meritocracy. If you could do the work and you could do the work well, that's all that mattered, nothing else. Um, these are what came to be known as the Prairie School years, and you see a couple of the buildings there, the Darwin Martin House on the lower right, the Roby House on the lower left, um, exemplified by strong horizontal lines, overhanging eaves, the flatness of the prairie communicated in three dimensions. He builds a national reputation out of this, and he has commissions coming from all over the country. And he begins to articulate two important principles. He disagreed with his mentor, Louis Sullivan, by saying, Form and function are one thing. They have to be fully integrated. And he also came uh, to, to believe that architecture was not defined by design and structure, but rather that architecture was about the space within the structure and the lives that would be led within those buildings that he designed. But that was the nature of architecture itself. It was the purpose and the lives that would be served by the building. In 1909, there's a scandal. He leaves with that woman that you see on the right, uh, 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 May Machini, the wife of one of his clients. Um, he leaves with her to Europe, takes uh, her as a mistress. Uh, they go to Europe in order to publish um, what uh, is known as the Bosmouth Portfolio. It's the first international publication of Wright's work in 1911. Um, he can't return to Oak Park, a small suburban community outside of Chicago. The scandal is too great. He is not divorced, she is not divorced, and they're living in sin. Um, instead, he returns to his home territory in Wisconsin, and he builds a house called Taliesin. Taliesin is the shining brow in Welsh. It's actually the name of a, a medieval Welsh poet, but for Wright it also symbolized something else, that as he was building in that unglaciated landscape, one would not build at the top of the hill. The top of the hill was nature's territory. Nature had created that crowning achievement, if you will. Um, and at best, human beings should build at the brow level of the hill. So if you think of your head as, as the hill, he's building down here. 
and his build in Taliesin actually wraps itself around and embraces the hill and embraces this driftless area landscape. Um, some people have called Taliesin an autobiography in wood and stone because you see the fields where he worked as a kid, as a boy, where he said he added tired to tired working on his uncle's farm. You see um, the material coming directly from the surrounding area. The wood, the stone is all right there. Um, and he creates what seems to be a happy life there. But one day while he's in Chicago uh, working on a building, uh, he gets a phone call. There's been a fire at Taliesin. A servant uh, named Julian Carrollton, um, for reasons still unknown to this day, um, has locked people in the building, set it on fire, and as they tried to escape, he bludgeoned them with a hatchet. Um, May Machini, two of her children, not by right, but by, by uh, their father, Edwin Machini, and a number of workers were killed that day. Um, Wright returns with Mr. Genie on the same train to Taliesin to claim the bodies, and he starts to rebuild. Um, the, uh, this marked the end of the prairie school years. He rebuilt Taliesin in a different style, and he began a long phase of experimentation. Um, we often get asked at the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation about mistresses, murders, and leaky roofs, as I said. Um, the mistresses are a sign of Wright's unconventional thinking, whatever we may think morally as to whether we approve or don't approve of that. This is a man who felt bound by no convention in life or in architecture, and at least on the architecture side, that's why he achieved what he achieved. Uh, the murders, as I mentioned, um, uh, mark the closing of a, pa of a passage in his life. Um, we don't know if he would have gone on to do the work he did or would he have been trapped continuing in the prairie style for the rest of his life. So a hard way to close a chapter, to be sure, but definitely a reason to close a chapter. And the leaky roofs, well, they're just a sign of an experimental architect, an experimental life. Um, uh, he found people over the course of his career who'd be willing to take these risks with him, um, and some of them wound up with leaky roofs. Uh, Herbert Johnson of S.C. Johnson, when he called Frank to complain about the roof leaking on his head in the middle of the dinner party, um, was told by Mr. Wright, you know, him, move the goddamn chair. Um, <laughs> don't, don't fix the roof. <laughs> so he begins this period of experimentation. He goes to Japan and builds the Imperial Hotel, which you see on the right. The Imperial Hotel is one of very few structures to survive the 1923 earthquake that leveled most of Tokyo. Um, so bear in mind, roofs leak, but the structure stayed up um, uh, through a, a major earthquake. And he began to experiment with new building methods. What you see on the right there are uh, the Storer House, the Ennis House, both in Los Angeles and the Arizona Biltmore in, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, which were constructed in a style called textile block architecture. This was meant to lower the cost of buildings and increase the flexibility of building material so that it could be easily constructed um, and, and yet embellished with appropriate adornment in a very simple and repetitive manner. Um, these buildings leak. These buildings have lots of problems because they are experimental buildings. The Ennis House, the one on the, the lower uh, left there, um, is owned by a billionaire who is worried that he's not going to become a bi be a billionaire by the time he's finished owning the Ennis House. So much work to be done. Um, in the 30s, the Depression hits and there's not a lot of work to do. So he's married a, his third wife, Olga Vanna Wright, um, and he begins an apprenticeship program. Young men and women from around the country and a couple from overseas will pay him a few hundred dollars and they get to live and work at Taliesin. When there is work, um, that work will be shared and these people will, these young people will learn by doing. Otherwise, they're farming, they're um, uh, working on the buildings, they're doing whatever needs to be done around the estate. Um, uh, it's sort of a, uh, a precursor to the modern day kibbutz in Israel. It's a bit of a socialist collective in a, in a sense. Um, and that they're all pooling their interests and getting together and pooling their money to survive the lean years. But they weren't completely lean. Um, one of the houses you see here you surely recognize, and that's Falling Water, built in 38, started in 36. Edgar Kaufman out in uh, Pittsburgh has his son, um, Edgar Jr., as one of the apprentices. And Edgar convinces um, his father to take a chance on Mr. Wright to build their country home in Bear Run, Pennsylvania, and what a home it was. To set the context for that home, 
Um, something else that was happening in the Depression was the emergence on the American scene of the international style of architecture. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, all these uh, German and Dutch uh, emigres coming to the US, uh, beginning their work here, bringing their style here. Another architect named Philip Johnson holds an exhibition of their work at the Museum of Modern Art in the early 30s and doesn't include Wright, saying Wright is the greatest architect of the 19th century and international style is where we're heading. Well, Falling Water is an international style building. It is Wright's only international style building and it is regarded worldwide as the most important house ever built by the members of the American Institute of Architects um, who, who looked at this earlier this year. So if you're gonna put, try to play a game of one-upsmanship with Frank Lloyd Wright, he's gonna win. He's gonna design Falling Water. The house on the left is the first, uh, sorry, it's not the first, it's, a, it's an example of what uh, is known as a Usonian house, Usonia. United States of North America. I guess USONA didn't have the same range to it. Um, but these were houses that were designed for people of modest means with whom Wright was concerned over his whole career. Um, simple, uh, single level for the most part. This one happens to be a two level house that could be afforded by ordinary working people. First one was built um, up in Madison, Wisconsin. It's known as the Jacobs House. Um, and there were over 300 USONIAN houses built. Um, and we'll talk more about those in a moment. In 39, the 72 year old Mr. Wright is suffering from pneumonia. His doctors say, We need you to get out to, uh, out, to um, uh, out, of, out of Wisconsin in any event. He goes out to a place that he was fond of, uh, to, uh, to Arizona, and he builds Talios and West. That's the image on the upper right of the drafting studio there. Pardon me, he's uh, inspired by the creative geometry of the desert. It's raw, it's brutal. It is as masculine and hard as the rolling hills of western Wisconsin were feminine and round. Um, and this inspires this whole new outburst. Oh, thank you. I got no thanks. Uh, the, uh, and so he, uh, he begins to design over the last 20 years of his life more buildings than he designed in the first 72 years of his life. These include Florida Southern College, which I had the pleasure of visiting in Lakeland uh, about a month ago. Price Tower, his only skyscraper, which you see here. The Marin County Civic Center, or some people know it as the set for Gattaca, because even now it still looks like it's something from the future. A, a fundamentally radical design and theater in Dallas called the Kalita Humphreys. The Guggenheim, of course, the Guggenheim Museum, which you also see on the screen. And Usonian automatic houses. These are like the Usonian, the Usonian houses, these simple uh, designs for working class people. Um, but these could be constructed as kits, and so they were very, very simple to build. Um, the career of Frank Lloyd Wright can be summed up in a few things. And I, this is where we start to get the brand of America's greatest architect. Um, there we go. 70 years of bold experimentation. The man never looks backwards, once. Pioneering use of open floor plans. Uh, remember, uh, those of a certain age will remember when the open floor plan became all the rage in offices? Well, it wasn't new, it was old, it was really old. You're gonna see the first one. Um, new materials, new lighting systems, heating, cooling, structural innovations. A man whose work is unlike any other American architect of his time. He builds in 36 states, three countries, but he has an influence globally. He designs over 1,100 structures. 500 of them were actually built. 440 of them remain in existence, and 73 of them are open to the public. And then coming back to this theme that I hope you're getting uh, is important to me in the foundation, a man who's constantly teaching us about the inspiration of nature, um, how we can work with nature, and the inspiration and how we express through architecture our fundamental American values. Um, I, I am so proud to be the person who's the standard bearer of this legacy because he inspired me in so many ways. And I just feel like as we look at his 150th birthday uh, next week, a week from today, that we have much to be proud of as a nation that produced this genius. Um, so, say so those are elements of his brand, but he also he had a few other elements. As I said, he wanted to live an unconventional life. And he, in the course of doing so, he created this uniquely American architecture, always seeking excellence. Excellence, excellence, excellence. He hated mediocrity, couldn't stand it, had no use for it. Um, 
he felt no constraint of history, and yet he was deeply aware of it, you would even say rooted in it, because history would be the source for inspiration, rather than a constraint as so many architects and designers of his time felt it was, that we had to embrace classical columns and classical temples. No, we had to create our own in Frank Lloyd Wright's world. A career marked by limitless innovation, um, no building, <coughs> went without some type of new feature in it over the course of his career. And to say, connected to nature, but also deeply connected to people. If you were to ask a child today, if you have a child in your, in your life, go home and do this. Um, how do you draw a house? It's a box and it has a triangle on top, right? Isn't that the way we all learn to draw houses? Um, and that's the way houses were being built. Boxes with triangles on top. Um, right, and inside those boxes, by the way, what did you have? Lots of little boxes, rooms. Wright broke these boxes. He changed the shape of architecture. He opened up the floor plans from inside to outside. So as you can see in the photo, you can start seeing through entire houses. No more looking through little tiny windows in the walls to get a little glimpse of nature. Windows were primarily designed to keep nature out. Um, Wright instead, wanted us to be looking outside. I think he would not have been entirely happy that we spent so much time looking at his buildings when so much of his work was designed for you to look from. Even in this room, we see that influence as we look outside from the architecture. That's what modernism was about. He designed to the human scale. The lives of people would be important. Um, and so everything had to factor in our humanity. And he called all of this, this, this synth a synthesis of inside and outside, nature and built, architecture and people's lives. This natural synthesis would be called organic architecture. He exposed us through a lot of effort. He published house plans. This one's on the screen, is from the Ladies' Home Journal. He's built models and sent them around the country in exhibits. Broad Acre City was his answer to urbanism and, and the crowded cities that he was seeing rising up. He gave lectures, he published papers and books. Um, to one way to pay for things in the Depression, he wrote and published an autobiography. He courted the leading influences of their time. He wasn't so interested in the trade press. Yes, he talked to architecture magazines and newspapers, but he was more interested in talking to House Beautiful because he wanted to talk to people. If people embraced his ideas, if people got to know them, that would change American building and architecture and in turn change the world. So House Beautiful publishes a retrospective of his career, mid-career. Um, exhibits all over the country that he would organize himself, shameless self-promoter, Frank Lloyd Wright, but the exhibits were so important that there's actually a book that's just been published, that's what's up on the screen, about his exhibits. Um, with the plans for falling water being, being seen, and you can see it in the background there, the success of that building, Time Magazine puts him on the cover. And he becomes friends with Henry and Claire Booth Luce. Uh, we have some artwork created by Claire Booth Luce while they were living at Talias and West uh, up in the living room. But uh, uh, they, they recognize this man's unique achievements. And he does something, again, sort of unheard of. Yes, there's plaques and there's cornerstones, but he would actually sign his buildings with these small Cherokee red tiles and his initials uh, bearing his signature because he wanted people to know that it was unmistakably his work, his idea. Um, he has a commercial plan. He creates kid houses. So there were these Sears Roebuck houses going back into the 19th century that were these bland, banal houses, often working men's cottages. He thought we could do better, so he creates a system of kid houses called the American System Built Houses. The Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation Archive has more drawings associated with these buildings because there were over 30 designs. Um, and they all had to be something that could be executed by ordinary people, ordinary owners in the field. No professional contractors. Sorry to those people in the construction trade here. He, he was trying to get people to be able to do this on their own. Um, so lots of detailed drawings. The thing that caused the failure of, of this, uh, this system, which started in 1915, was the need for the material that was being used in these kits for World War I. Otherwise, we'd probably see a lot more of these houses. And these plans were very simple. They were being advertised in newspapers. 
and a simple working man's cottage, well, it could look like that. Um, that's in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, on a block of several of these, uh, of these system-built houses called the Burnham Blocks. He would elevate design and bring into the working man's life some beauty, some high craft levels of craftsmanship that weren't being offered to those people um, in his time. He also personified the brand. He tried to live this organic life, um, responding to nature. He liked to talk about these American values and promote them everywhere. Of course, his architecture was well known, but so was his style, the pork pie hat, the cane, the cape, or the scarf everywhere. He didn't need the cane to walk, by the way. That was to be able to make a dramatic gesture at somebody, point the cane. He had this, this manner of speaking um, uh, and, and in writing that, um, that just captivated people. Uh, he, could, he could hold their attention. He was eminently quotable, very, very quotable, often with controversy. In one of those quotes, he, uh, he talks about how he, pref when people would call him arrogant, he'd said, you know, I've done something in this life. I would prefer to have an honest arrogance than a false modesty. If you've done something in the world, you shouldn't be ashamed to talk about it. You should be telling people about it. And he certainly was an avid individualist. Um, he also licensed his brand. Um, the, uh, uh, again, not something that people in his time did, but paints, fabrics, uh, wallpaper, rugs, china, <laughs> silver, crystal, all these things, uh, furniture, came out from leading companies like Henredon and, uh, and Schumacher, Martin Senor Paints. Um, I'm really happy that one of the things we did this year is we, uh, we started a new licensing partnership with Schumacher. It had gone away about 30 years ago. And, uh, and we brought them back in, and that was just launched uh, last month. Uh, so uh, his first licensee became his most recent licensee again. But all as a way to bring his, his design sensibility into people's homes. That was, that was what he was aiming for. The, um, I'm going to rush through the next couple of slides because I realize this is going slower than I planned. So let's talk about, uh, about business. Um, he worked for businessmen, unspoiled men with uh, business, um, with instincts and ideals. That's what he wanted to attract. He brought leading industrialists into his work, and he built buildings for them. The Larkin Building um, uh, in, uh, in uh, Buffalo, New York, was the first modern office building of his design. You see this imposing brick edifice that was designed to keep the industrial environment in which it was built outside, the smoke, the noise, everything else. Um, inside it would be something different. So let's talk about the, the brand values of the building. Um, uh, of the company, rather. They were all about making the lives of the women of the house easier and better. Um, they had, uh, they made soap, they had a diverse catalog, as big as the Sears catalog. They employed um, associates like Avon does to go to people's homes. They had the parties before Tupperware had their parties. And they produced magazines to develop this interest in the Larkin look. Larkin, however, had an idea for his business. Um, the, uh, he said, I wish to unite the interests of employer and employee, making all work more pleasant and better paid. So what did he do? Um, he built a building with Frank Lloyd Wright to embody that idea. The building, as I said, with this imposing brick edifice, would communicate values. Um, to the world, it reflected global ambitions. He had four globes on the outside of the building. To the worker, he told them they were important. Honest labor needs no master, and simple justice needs no slaves. That's what you walk past every day on your way into the building. And once you got inside, no more brick imposing structure. Instead, you had transparency, space, light, and air. Sometimes people gasp when they see how different the building was on the inside versus the outside. Workers and management could see each other instead of being shielded from each other. Um, and, and everything was about cleanliness, um, the, uh, the white interior, the lightness, um, that ability to, to just have air, free-flowing air and space. Um, leadership and design combined to create a shared set of values among employees, managers, customers, and executives. Innovation, a fundamental value of the Larkin Company, was built into the building. It was fireproof. It used new material called magnesite that not only made it fireproof, but also added soundproofing in this open floor plan. It had some of the earliest air conditioning in the United States. A 
toilets were hung from the walls for the first time rather than being built onto the floor so they could be cleaned, so the rooms could be cleaned more easily. An open floor plan, a pneumatic vacuum cleaning system that had not been deployed before. Adjustable desks and chairs. Anybody here work on a standing desk? The, uh, okay, that's not new. This is where it got started, um, this notion of a repositionable desk. Electric intercoms and purified drinking water were all innovations that Wright brought into the building to reflect the company's values and their brand. In the Larkin building, Wright achieved the full integration of a building, its surrounding environment by having this difference between the exterior and the interior, the company's management, um, and its workers. And he did it all with a single design that brought all of these things together. The architecture itself, uh, Mr. Larkin would say, represented the brand of Larkin. Uh, today, we work in anonymous office buildings, right? We throw a brand on the outside, and that's how we brand the building. But this was the building as a brand itself, and it was a remarkable achievement. Um, sadly, the Depression got the best of this company. In 1942, it was liquidated, and that rather bad photograph that you see on the right, that's all that remains of the Larkin building, which was demolished in 1950. Uh, those of us who are architectural enthusiasts mourn its passing. Um, uh, I go to Buffalo, and I pay a little tribute to that, uh, to that little pier that remains. Wright did it again, by the way, in the 30s. The S.C. Johnson Administration Building, and then at the end of the war, the Research Tower, 1944. So let's talk about this as well. S.C. Johnson is a family company. Um, it's referred to itself that way for, for nearly a century. Several core values. A progressive company had one of the first pension plans for its employees, which it developed to get people through the Depression. Um, it established a community fund, um, which is a precursor to the United Way. Uh, Sam Johnson, the founder, said the goodwill of people is the only enduring thing in any business. So this notion of respect for employees and for customers was critical. Um, a company built around innovation, self-expression, and entrepreneurship were early values and continuing values of the company. And risk-taking. This is a company that sent out 28,000 cases of glow coat wax to its customers in the middle of the Depression and said, pay us when you can, when no money is tight. Um, they took a lot of risks. Um, Johnson, needing a new building for his growing company, wanted the best architect in America because he wanted the best building in America. And what did he get? Well, let's talk about it. He got a place where work is important. Again, workers and management connected visibly through an open floor plan. An environment where interaction between employees could be spontaneous and direct. Uh, you didn't have to go through departments, you were just all right there. And he wanted an enduring symbol of the company's creative and adventurous spirit. How would you like to walk into that reception area every day? Um, right, inspired by nature, looks at a staghorn troy of cactus, a bit of a weed plant in the desert, and looks at its skeleton, the symbol mesh, and he sees strength there because the slender stalk is going to support all this weight on top of uh, this cactus. You can see that on the left. He embodies that by designing pillars with a stem, a calyx, and a petal like a plant. From this, he would see strength. That mesh structure, when incorporated, would allow him to achieve something extraordinary. The, build, the people that were responsible for enforcing the building code weren't going to let him build this building because they said the pillars won't support the roof. So he builds a pillar, and he achieves what they are supposed to achieve, six tons of weight being supported on the pillar. Um, then he starts adding more weight. When they get to 18, I'm sorry, 18 times weight, um, uh, 60 plus tons, they run out of space to put material on top of this pillar, but the pillar is not cracked yet. This is strength inspired from nature, right understood what he was doing. Um, and so they start to build this building, a forest of columns that would support a glass sky. Or as Wright said, it was designed to be as inspiring a place to work in as any cathedral cathedral ever was to worship in. So that's the roof made of Pyrex tubing on top of those pillars, and that's the workspace of the administration building. Um, still is breathtaking today. I was there two weeks ago. So, you know, what we want to do, and this is what the work of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation is, is we want people to look at these principles. Um, nature is offering us many gifts, um, and we should be paying attention to them. Observe nature 
and then act with intention to bring nature into your environment in some way, whether you bring it in a structure or by capturing views and borrowing the landscape as part of your architecture. That's what Frank Lloyd Wright is telling us to do. Build buildings that bless the landscape and be of the environment and not merely on the environment or in the environment. Become an organic part of that world around you. Pay attention to the human scale and the lives that are being led in the buildings and enhance these organic relationships. Relationships of building to land, the relationship of buildings to, um, to, to the people who are, being, uh, who are going to be housed and working in them. Um, the relationship of the building to the purpose for which it's being built. And then, really importantly, the relationships of people to people, because that's, at the end of the day, what the building should be serving, is how we interact with each other. And if the building is stopping us from doing that the way we like, then we have no use for that building. Frank Lloyd Wright said, the longer I live, the more beautiful life becomes. If you foolishly ignore beauty, you'll find yourself soon without it. Your life will be impoverished. But if you invest in beauty, it will remain with you for all the days of your life. So thank you, Economic Club. I'm going to image here of Florida Southern. She knows you, Larry. <laughs> real, real simple question. Will the world ever see another Black Frank Lloyd Wright? Uh, I hope not, <laughs> mostly because Wright would have hated that. He hated when his students and apprentices would try to create buildings that looked like his. He, he was all about people finding their own authentic voices. That was what was so critical. Um, and so certainly we want people to be inspired by his ideas and his architecture and to embody those ideas in their building. But we want people to find their own voices, even at the School of Architecture that we have as the foundation. That's what we tell people. Find your own authentic voice and go out and do good in the world with it. The little kids that come up for our ed programs, that's what we say to them. Even if they hate architecture, they hate Frank Lloyd Wright, but they find their own voices, we win the day when those kids find their voices and use them to make a difference in the world. So that's what we're about. Good afternoon. How are you doing? First of all, I want to say thank you for coming, telling us about White Kids history and his journey through my pleasure. And everything. I'm Howard Milligan, uh, a representative of Florida A&M University. My question is a little bit more about the essence of writing. I believe that with art, it's something that if you're taking your theme and you're putting it into a tangible asset, whether it's through photography or filmmaking, like I do, but you feel it was like Mr. Wright did. How do you do? You have any suggestions for how you know? We connect other people to, you know, to their being, so that way we can bring in this more beautiful world that I believe White and Wright envisioned through his architecture. How other artists <laughs> bring it into their world and everything. Like my question is, how do you, how do us as human beings go about getting connected to the essences in our souls and becoming greater artists and pushing the world forward through beauty like Wright did. That's a great question, and I, I wish I really had an answer to that. But here, here's what I, what I guess I think. And remember, I'm not an artist. I'm, I'm, I'm not an architect. But, um, but I, I'm married to an artist. I've spent a lot of my life with artists. Here's what I think. And I think it's not just true for artists. I think it's for everybody. There's a feeling that you get when you do certain things, when you see certain things, when you have certain experiences, that you just, uh, there's no word for it. It's passion. It, you, you feel differently. You come to life in a different way. And I think when you communicate that out to others, it's infectious. Um, and I think that's at the root of all art. Uh, hopefully that's at the root of many, if not most, human pursuits. Um, that's why I say, for Frank Lloyd Wright, it was all about this notion of authenticity, finding his voice. If he had chosen the easy path, which is to go off to Europe, follow the conventional life, we wouldn't have had the innovation. Um, maybe someone else would have come up with it, maybe not, we won't know that. But because he chose the thing that inspired him, which was this relationship to nature, and he looked around and saw all the gifts that nature was offering and used them as a source of inspiration, that's what enabled him to find his voice. So figure out what, what you know, inspires your voice, what drives your passion, and then use that. Use that in every single thing that you do. And as I say, it just becomes infectious. I, I honestly believe the whole universe conspires at that point to help you achieve what you're trying to achieve. So 
I hope you, and I, I think there are student representatives here. Well, as you finish up your career, do that. Use that to inspire your passion, and I have no doubt you'll be successful. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much, and I hope you'll be here for those of you who have additional questions. And we do, will be presenting you with a limited edition of an eagle that has been sculpted by our local and nationally recognized sculptor, Sandy Clark. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so very much. Sorry to have gone on a little longer oh. than I expected. Oh.